What's up and how are you, Shape America? The podcast is back on. This is your host, Sean Nevels, and we have taken some time off here this spring into the summer, but a lot of big things have happened. Obviously, the Shape America National Convention in New Orleans happened. Hopefully, you were able to attend. If not, you missed something special. And even if you did not, now is the time to start planning for Shape America National Convention in Seattle, Washington in 2023 at the end of March. Make sure um, if, you, if you're submitting a proposal, Proposal, you can do that uh, through July. Also, just start making your plans, your travel plans, and all that. Your budgeting plans to be there uh, in Seattle, Washington, in 2023. So we are back. This is the EDI podcast, and this is series two, where we will focus on culturally relevant pedagogy and practices in health and physical education, and also student voice and agency and empowering actions. So we're glad to be back on the podcast. If you uh, tuned in or haven't tuned in. In. This is, the, uh, I believe, the fourth or fifth episode. We had series one um, uh, back last year, which is what is social justice. So make sure you check out those episodes all available on whatever, wherever you listen to your uh, podcast. Um, make sure you follow this uh, Shape America uh, podcast. So I say all that to say we're back here and this is series two and this is the first episode of series two and I am honored to have on from Springfield College Assistant Professor of Physical Education Dr. Corey Boyd. Dr. Boyd how are you doing? I'm well Sean thank you for having me. It is an honor to have you on. So Dr. Boyd real quick tell us about yourself introduce yourself and particularly your research in this work. Yeah, so my name is uh, Sean Seb. My name is Corey Boyd. Uh, I'm originally from Columbia, South Carolina. Currently, I am a assistant professor at Springfield College, and my major responsibilities are teaching within an initial licensure undergraduate and graduate program. Uh, specifically, I teach secondary methods and uh, motor development to uh, our general as a general ed for our uh, our department or our school. Um, my research topic, uh, research focuses are kind of two branches. Uh, the first is teacher education. Um, in that, um, I'm very interested in looking at uh, models, uh, sp specifically sport ed and teaching games for understanding to teach culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, and secondly, uh, I'm very interested in diversifying the teacher pipeline um, from uh, initial licensure all the way through the professorate and even back full circle to faculty members their experiences uh, within the academy um, as being either uh, Latinx or women, despite their uh, how they are identified, my interest is in looking at diversity and kind of a full spectrum from teacher ed all the way through um, Pete through the professorate. Thank you so much for that intro. Um, before we actually get on topic here of our series, I want I do want to go back real quick um, about diversifying the teacher workforce. Now, can you tell us um, how do you how how do how do you go about that and why it's so important? Well, I think we'll start with the latter. I think it's important because if we look at our nation, we look at kind of what's going on around us. Our schools are becoming a lot more diverse. However, our teacher prep programs are doing the exact opposite and not just teacher prep programs. We see that a lot in exercise science, um, athletic training, strength and conditioning. And so we have this diverse population that is being served, but the people who are serving don't reflect the population. So that's the initial problem or initial, I won't say problem, but that's the initial uh, foothold that we have and kind of we see. But I guess the bigger issue or the biggest thing that we can start doing is one, the ways in which we recruit, right? Recruitment and relationship developing is very important. Um, even from high school to college, even from undergrad to graduate school, those mentorship and those relationships that you can build with peak programs could be vitally important, right? Even in uh, other alternative licensure programs are vitally important, but sometimes we overlook those, how impactful those could be even for people who are coming back after a second career. And then also we find a lot of persons of color that are coming through a turn of certification program. So there's multiple ways that we can attach or approach this problem. Um, I've been a part of recruiting programs and bridge programs myself as a graduate student. Um, even as an undergraduate student, I was a part of a program called Call Me Mister at South Carolina State. And that is a program that 
is aimed to putting African-American males in the classroom from K through 12, but specifically elementary school. So that was kind of my first introduction to teacher ed through an initiative at or through Clemson South or Clemson University. And so in all practicality, the best way to get more diversity in is first you have to have the financial support, right? The financial backing from, if we're speaking of, you know, PEAT programs or physical education, teacher education programs, the department and the institution has to be not only committed in the social cause of it, but they also have to be financially committed because there's some things that, there's some needs that students may need to have. There's, um, you know, ways you have to attract students to come to campus. There's ways that you have to support students that may look different for other, uh, other spaces, but also not only with the financial support, there also needs to be a level of self-awareness in those PEAT programs, right? There's a lot of times where um, through good intentions, we may have white faculty or other faculty that may create an environment that could be potentially hostile, right? I've been you know, in environments where I knew people had their best intentions. However, the environment was extremely tense, right? For reasons beyond my control, reasons that I could identify, reasons I couldn't identify, However, there's kind of a juxtaposition with how do we get more diversity, how do we retain the diversity, but more importantly, how do we get that diversity back out to the field, which is kind of a ever evolving type of cycle, right? Because it's not only to get them, that's good, but you gotta keep them. And once you keep them, you have to groom them. And once you groom them, you gotta put them out there. Once they get out there, they have to stay there. They have to do well there, but then also they have to do well, they have to start recruiting their own students. So it's kind of this, ecosystem of recruiting. So it's not a clean cut answer, but it's a multifaceted approach. But the biggest thing we all could do is, especially if you're a higher ed professional, first looking at what young black faculty or Latinx faculty are coming through uh, graduate PE programs and starting those recruiting relationships early. Right? I got to Springfield College through great recruiting uh, efforts and great relationships. I didn't know much about Springfield Mass, all the new Springfield College for um, their uh, being the birthplace of basketball. But beyond that, I didn't know much about their peak program. I had my eyes set on certain institutions, but when I just started developing a relationship with my department chair and the former dean, that kind of opened the doors up for me. That kind of demystified what you know schools in New England look like, what private colleges in the Northeast look like, because I've never had any experience with institutions or even small institutions in general but through those relationships it made it more attractive through the support of my colleagues here made it so that I could stay but more importantly the initial push to get into this space from my my mentorship from graduate school really helped me not only develop the skills and the tools I needed but also with those those skills and those tools I was able to navigate right there's a a lot of people think, well, I have the skills, but okay, that's one thing, but you have to actually have to apply those skills and cultivate and curate a career that is streamlined, that it's relevant, but also that's in a space where, you know, people recognize your work, right? And so that's something that I don't attribute to myself. I just attribute to the support system that's been around me. Um, and so honestly, diversity and recruitment efforts are just a one big kind of a communal thing in, in short. That's a no, that's a that was the great way to put it right there. We appreciate that. And then also, hey, shout out to uh Springfield College. You know, a lot of people, you know, a part of this uh, EDI committee with Shape America are from there, are done work, you know, with Shape America and things like that. And then also, too, I did at the uh, convention in New Orleans, I did stop and have a great conversation with a with the, one of the professors there that had the booth, the Springfield College booth at the at the exhibition hall uh in New Orleans. So hey, shout out to Springfield College and great work and everything you said there doc we appreciate that so now let's get into our topic and that's culturally relevant pedagogy now before we even get to talk about how people can implement it let's define it because i believe you know especially in the the political space we're in people hear certain terms and think they understand what it means so if you can uh dr boyd please first you know explain what culturally relevant pedagogy is uh, and then from there especially in the space of health and physical education how can we implement that so I will, in fairness, I will speak from my lens. Um, initially, I, I always tell students, you know, culturally relevant is being self-aware, right? Being aware of who you are, who you're not, where you are, uh, what that space is, 
Um, but secondly, uh, culturally relevant pedagogy is good teaching. It's flat out solid pedagogy, right? And you can't, you know, I tell students all the time that you, you can, it's great to have a social justice orientation orientation and teaching, but that's great, but what are you gonna teach? And it doesn't have to be anything traditional. It doesn't have to be anything mainstream, but at the end of the day, if you're gonna be culturally relevant, if you're gonna be a good teacher, if you're gonna, as Paolo at first said, if you're gonna look at students as a whole person, you have to be able to give them something. So good culturally relevant pedagogy at the end of the day is good pedagogy, right? And I think, you know, some may not appreciate this, but I think sometimes there's a space where I think people are hiding behind, oh, I go into this space, the students aren't relating to me. It has to be the culture. No, you just have bad pedagogy. It's just bad pedagogy, right? You just, you don't understand your content. You don't um, understand task progressions. It's not good pedagogy, right? And once you understand the pedagogy, the cultural relevance will start to emerge because every space has a different culture. Right, Missouri has a different culture, even within Missouri, right? There's some people in Missouri that call it Missouri. You have other people that are around Columbia that call it Missouri. And that in and of itself is different cultures, but I can't teach you that culture. You have to immerse yourself in that culture, but also you have to have the, sc the skills, the social skills, the soft skills, the emotional intelligence to recognize, oh, this is a different space. This is what I am. This is what I am not. This is what these students need. This is what they don't need. And how can we, give them voice to finding out the happy medium. And that takes self-reflection, that takes a level of work that oftentimes that, you know, I can't say just in physical education that people don't wanna do that work because that's really self-work, right? You have to be self-actualized to understand, you know, as a lot of people will say paideia or um, culturally relevant pedagogy. So if you don't have knowledge of self, it's really hard to be relevant to anyone else's culture if you don't know Kind of who you are you don't know what you're actually in there doing it's just this three-way alignment that will never become come together you're just this disjointed figure and you're you know saying kids don't relate to me but people want to learn people want to be seen people want to be challenged and if you can't do that that's not culture that's just bad pedagogy all right hit him hard with that one okay so i, I mean I think we got there and you get you did a great job defining it. So now let's just get to the nuts and bolts of it again, necessarily, and how that, you know, the implementation of it, you know, what if if I was a new teacher coming in and I'm saying, OK, you know, I'm in this new environment. I see what my students are, who they are. I at least have an idea of who I am. Where where do I start then? Where do I start in a in a in a PE classroom <laughs> towards just, you know, full implementation of culturally relevant teaching? Well, first you have to set a clear expectation. Everything needs to be clear, just clear. You know, what is the expectation? Is, you know, when you come in the classroom or if you're coming from, let's say we have sixth graders, you're coming from social studies and you walk down the hallway, is the expectation that you stand at the door until I open the door and I give everybody a fist bump. You go to your team spots, you go to the locker room, do what you need to do and practically, you need to have a clear expectation, but not only, not only having the expectation, you need to understand why you have that procedure, why you have that routine, right? Not, not because you want to keep them in control, not because you want to, you know, have a neat classroom, but in some areas, in some cultures, or even some spaces, not even affluent, low SES, students need to learn how to socially behave in certain spaces. They need, you know, there's a level of guidance that teachers need to teach. Sometimes it's not even just the content, sometimes it's, it's worthwhile learning how to stand in the line patiently, right? That will take you further in life sometimes than learning how to, you know, play a modified game sometimes, learning how to sit in a line, learning how to come somewhere and do what you're supposed to do without anybody prompting you to do that. Like that in and of itself is important. So, you know, I, like I tell students all the time, you have to start with the expectations and the expectation has to be clear the expectation has to be not even fair. It has to be rational, right? So if you're working yes. with students and it's not going to work the first day, right? Is, you know, you might need to spend the first month just working on coming in the building, leaving out the building, coming in, sitting down, coming in, sitting down. And that sounds so mundane and people say, oh, they're not getting MVPA. That's okay. Because if you don't have a solid environment, you can't deliver any content. 
right? You can't, right. it's like, it's like this call, right? We can have a great computer, you have a great setup over there, but if we don't connect to the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi is the content, we just have a computer, you're sitting over there in Missouri, Sue's where she is, uh, Kendra's where she is, and I am where I am. We just have this disjointed thing, but we have to connect. A lot of times that connection is expectations. And once students see, oh, this person's coming in here and they have an expectation of me every single day, all right, I can't really get away with this, but you know, maybe let me see what they have to say. That may not always work for every student, but sometimes you may not catch every student the first time. You might catch every student the second time, but they're seeds that you're sown. And I think the bigger picture people have to see what is a bigger picture we're doing, right? We're trying to make more deposits and we make withdrawals, right? You may not cash out every Friday, but if you keep making that deposit, that withdrawal may come in a form of, you see a kid, you know, five, 10 years later, like, hey, you know, I remember being in your class and I'm a, I'm a physical education teacher now. And that's what happened to me, right? Like I remember Judy Rink coming to my classes, sending her teacher, student teachers to our classes. I thought it was fun. We would play good pickleball units. We have a bunch of different units, but I could always remember how structured the spaces were and that level of expectation coming into that space. Like, oh, I can't play around. I can't come in here without my tennis shoes on. I can't, you know, take 10 minutes in the locker room, horseplay. And through that, I saw like, man, this is an actual profession. This is something I actually can do. I can see myself in this. I saw a voice, I saw an identity. And that took me further than what I ever thought, but it really started with the level, in my opinion, for me, the level of expectation that was delivered, right? My physical education teacher was a uh, mid 30 young man from Lexington, South Carolina, very, not a diverse space, um, had a deep country twang, but taught me how to do electric slide, right? <laughs> and, and I say all that to say is once we start to see that one, we could be trusted in that space, he delivered great pedagogy. He flat out would teach us from, from the electric slide all the way through ropes courses. And that's where I was, that's, thank you for that. Cause that's what I was gonna take you to next. You know, we set the expectations and now what does that look like in the content? So in the content, it, you know, I tell students it doesn't have to be traditional and that content has to start off. I typically say it start off in like a, a very, if students are ready in a, almost a modified game or also just in a small task, right? Can you control the object by yourself, right? So we're playing badminton or we're playing pickleball. Can you just hold the pickleball and the pickleball in, a pack, in, the, in the paddle and just hit it by yourself, right? Instead of jumping into a space or even assuming that students know what pickleball is or even not even giving the paddle, starting with the ball and telling you, can you throw this ball to the person across the room from me and catch it off in one bounce? So really meeting them in a space where learning can actually take place, right? And I see it so often, even with pre-service teachers, Students that come in, they can't do it under our forearm pass. And say, like, oh, these kids just don't play sports. They don't go outside, they don't do anything. Great, but why aren't you teaching it in a way where they understand? Right? And I've had a conversation with teachers and say, well, would you expect the kid to read Shakespeare fluently the first time they saw it? No, you have to give it to them in a manual chunk. So I say, for me, one thing that I teach is we start with object control by yourself, object control with a partner, and then go into a either small-sided game, but stay where the students are. And some students aren't ready for certain content, but also you have to be aware of that content, right? Everything doesn't have to be a traditional sport. I don't teach traditional sports. I teach, you know, cricket from uh, team handball to badminton. Um, I do play around with a lot of net and wall games, but I rarely bring out nets. I rarely bring out the actual racket. I let them do, use their hand to play four square, play some sort of modified game. So for me, culturally relevant looks like, you know, scaffolding. It looks like schemas. It starts very small instead of assuming that students know, right? Because students want to move, students want to play, right? And, you know, I think sometimes we think students don't want to play games, well, maybe they're not presenting the games or presenting the task in such a way that it's going to attract them to it. Right, so no one culture owns a sport, and so or an activity, but just present it in a way that students can really digest it. 